This is just a summary of the components in the demo. Let's get past this. All right, I'm going to run the demo. What you're going to see is that the market will continue to move very quickly. All right, um, price on the non-real-time version, price thresholds will be missed. And this will be represented by a graph in the GUI that dips down into the negative region and turns red, and it's just representing badness. It's loss of money. It's not a good situation. You'll also see in the console window that every once in a while, a limit order will not be able to be traded because that's the rule. If the price moves beyond the, the, uh, the threshold for a limit order, it cannot be traded. That's a really bad situation. In the real-time version, you're going to see goodness. All right. All the, tra all the uh, trade orders will be traded at their prices. No ticks will be missed from the market. The graph will stay nice and level and even, which represents that from a, from a broker point of view, my system traded the orders where they were supposed to occur. I didn't lose any money from my customers. All right, I'm going to start the demo now. It involves um, my MacBook here, which is going to run the GUI. I'm connected to a Solaris system, which, like most Solaris systems, is running in a lights out situation here below the podium, OK? And I have a network cable in between. So I have multiple console windows, and I'm going to be starting up processes. So I'm going to be staring at my MacBook. I'm going to bring the microphone over here. First thing I'm going to do is start the, can you still hear me? Uh oh. All right, can you hear me now? I'm going to start the GUI on my MacBook. It's going to connect to the application server, and using JMX will listen for trade notifications. That's JMX, not JMS. I'm going to start the, no, the non-real-time trading engine. I don't know if you can read that up there. It says trading engine. There's RT trading engine and NHRT trading engine. That's the real-time version and the no-heap real-time version. We'll do those next. First thing it's going to do is it's going to read from the file for orders. It's going to fill them in. And it's going to start up uh, JMS here. You see those log messages come out. That's good. Now I'm going to start my real-time data feed. And let me just say, whenever I'm in the situation like you are and I'm watching people give a demo, I always kind of secretly hope that something will go a little bit wrong just to watch the person sweat a little bit. I don't ever want it to go completely wrong because I want to see how the demo works. But um, you know, I just like to see the person sweat a little. But I assure you that will not happen today. I will not sweat because I'm used to it going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I have a list of excuses here already prepared if it does go wrong. And the first excuse I'll give you is that sometimes the, no, the non-real-time version executes well. There are no missed trades. Um, and that's because it's unpredictable as to when garbage collection will occur. And it might not occur. What I've done here is, in the implementation, is I've tried to ensure garbage collection will occur by starting it with a little bit of memory. I have the same requirements for the real-time version as well. They both started with a bounded amount of memory. OK, so the data feed is going to start up. What we're going to see here is as the trades occur, they're going to be plotted on this graph. Hopefully, we see lots, lots of bread. Yeah, we do. I only had one, one bad trade. Could run it again and show you that it usually is more. And we also have one missed limit sell price. So two things occurred. We had one trade occur, uh, traded at a lower price than it was supposed to. And we had one sell order that we couldn't sell at all because the market moved beyond and it was a limit order. So that's, that's badness. You know what? I'm going to run it again. OK, so the trading engine just started. I'm starting the data feed application. And uh, just to prove to you that it's, it's a real demo here, this should probably behave a little bit differently. Let's hope it behaves worse. No, it behaved better. So let's just stop right now. One more time. But this does go, proves the point that it's just unpredictable as to when garbage collection will occur. Before you saw that it did occur at a particular point, I missed a trade. This time I was a little luckier. But we're not always so lucky. 
And in the financial sector, with the financial companies, they can't take that risk. They have to do everything they can to mitigate that risk. And Java Real Time uh, offers them a competitive advantage. And you can see here I missed a, I missed a couple trades there. So I'm gonna, and we have lots of missed limit buys and sell. So bad stuff is occurring. I'm glad I reran it. Take a look at a couple other things. Look at the performance uh, chart here. We see that what I do is I actually time the execution through the loop. So if, it's in, if, it's, if the loop is interrupted for any particular reason, that gets added to the timing. And we see that we have three pretty big interrupts, 425 million nanoseconds. Those are pretty big interrupts there. And in that two, two or so seconds I ran it, you can see we spent about 135 milliseconds garbage collecting. That's a pretty big percentage of time. So that represents uh, the uh, interrupts there. As a matter of fact, you usually can, can take these performance blips and directly map them to, to trades that occur below their value or above their value, whatever they're supposed to occur, and then miss the limit prices. And that's exactly what happened. So now I'm going to run, I'm just going to skip right to the no heap real time version. Okay, so you can see it there, NHRT trading system. Everything else is going to remain the same. I'm going to bring up the GUI. Going to bring up the no heap implementation. Wait for the JMS messaging to occur here, the logging. I'm going to start the data feed application. Okay, so I'm going to get ready for my next excuse. Now let's just hope we see a nice flat line here. All right. That's good. It's still trading. I'm going to stop it, though, because it's done. We have no missed trades here. Remember that console messages we saw before? If I had missed any trades, I would have seen it. I didn't miss any trades. The trades that did occur occurred at the prices they were supposed to. Let's take a look at performance blips. I have nothing greater than a, a 1 million nanosecond blip at the, at the beginning, only because I do not initialize, pre-initialize the, uh, the VM before I run it, the classes in the VM before I run it. It's one step I can do to get rid of that initial blip, but it's still far smaller than the 425 million blip, uh, nanosecond blips we saw in the previous run. Um, it's also probably, it's always about a million uh, nanoseconds at the start. It's probably also due to the granularity of the timer in the, uh, this laptop. And I'm going to bring up the garbage collection here. We spent zero time garbage collecting. It's a no heap implementation using immortal memory, so that makes sense. Excuse me for that. I think that's pretty much it for me. Um, all right, I do have a slide here. It goes a little bit more into a little bit more detail. I think I have some time, right, right, Dave? Um, Java is built on Slaris because it's a true real-time operating system. You get the real-time scheduling, mission-critical reliability, and it's proven. It's been used, um, especially in the financial area, for many years on Wall Street. Um, the power of Java is that uh, you maintain the developer productivity. There's a large knowledge, knowledge base of, of Java programmers available. You want to be able to take advantage of that when you're developing real-time applications. You also want to make sure that Java developers can remain Java developers, that they don't have to employ any special object pooling or any other tricks to make sure that they, to try to make sure the garbage collector doesn't occur uh, when it's not supposed to. That's not the point. You should be able just to write the code you have to write, solve the problem you have to solve, and let the VM, in this case the Java real-time VM, handle all the scheduling for you. 